Hi, how are you? My name is Tehan Gim. Uh, I'm with American Bureau of Shipping, ABS. I'm sure uh, many of you, maybe all of you, are uh, familiar with what ABS does. This is um, uh, this is what we've been doing for quite many years, uh, and we thought this fits uh, well into the topic of the conference. Um, as Marin uh, wonderfully said, it's need holistic approach. And at the end of the day, a lot of topics uh, is about ship design, and you have to go back to design of the ship, uh, new technologies should be incorporated into ships uh, in an optimal way. And what is the uh, optimal way? What is the optimal design? Uh, that sort of uh, question always uh, remains. And one way of answering that is, is CFT-based framework to do the optimization. That's what I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, today. This is not really, uh, this itself is not really new. It's been quite a while. Um, and I hope uh, you can enjoy uh, some of the slide. Here, um, ABS mission statement. You know what ABS is, but some of you uh, may not uh, have heard about ABS mission statement. ABS mission is to serve the public interest as well as the needs of our members and clients by promoting the security of life and property. Up until this part, it's about how to make uh, ships safer, how to ensure this ship is uh, safe. Uh, so it's a, a traditional classification society's business. Um, and, uh, and I think the next part is related to uh, the topic, preserving the natural environment, all those uh, statutory regulations and CO2 emissions and uh, how to make uh, shipping more sustainable. It's all related to how to uh, preserve our natural environment, uh, our world, our globe. So it's uh, very uh, much related to uh, our mission statement too. The topic of this uh, presentation didn't use the word parametric, uh, but here I'm gonna start talking about uh, parametric. Uh, uh, some of you uh, may not, uh, I, 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 I don't know, uh, parametric whole form optimization. Um, is there anybody who ha hasn't heard about what it is? So all knows that. So maybe I'm, I can skip it. Okay, so oh, I can uh, briefly touch in the next page. So, um, On the on the 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 triplets on the left side, I already talked about. Uh, on the right side, um, I'm gonna have a better picture uh, in the next slide. But uh, we do have a framework uh, using parametric CAD modeling software and optimization engines, and we do need a CFD because it's a CFD based, and uh, we we repeat uh, creating parametric holes. Uh, or any other any uh, had models of interest uh, and evaluated uh, using safety tools many many times and those process are all automatic but in order to to do that in uh, in an automatic uh, process you need to link them and also as you can easily expect there should be some sort of uh, initial input original hull form. And, and out of uh, the whole optimized framework will be the final uh, optimized whole form. So um, you heard about parametric whole form optimizations. Uh, so I can briefly uh, talk about it here. Um, whole form is modeled by parameters. It's basically numbers or variables using a parameter CAD modeling software. I know Marin has uh, its own uh, tools uh, plugged into uh, Rhino. Uh, we do have a, a commercial software called Cases. Uh, this is not our software. Uh, we're not really endorsing it, but we're using it uh, for many years. Uh, depending on uh, the area of interest, uh, relevant parameters, uh, design variables should be chosen and optimized 
Peggy is given objective functions. Uh, ob objective function, uh, each design variable produce a um, unique design candidate. Uh, so here in, in the context of a whole form optimization, when number changes, whole form changes. If you talk, if you want to change bow, uh, bulbous bow may may take a different form. Object objective functions can really be anything. Um, usual uh, uh, or most uh, common one is minimum power or maximum cargo capacity or combination of both. <laughs> but, uh, and these objective functions will be evaluated by safety tools. Uh, and, and as you can expect, it often becomes multi-objective non-linear optimization problems with a set of design constraints. And design space uh, is not known, and there's no easy way of uh, 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 visualizing uh, uh, design space. On the right side, there are a bunch of uh, uh, lines. Uh, before lines, there are variables, numbers, but uh, I don't know if uh, the mouse works or not. Sure. So these lines, uh, for example, is uh, Section right area curve, uh, I see deck line uh, or flat of bottom, flat of side, or, or the, the, the water line at the design draft or the draft of interest. So deep, really, uh, there is, you, you have to start, you have to, you can build or you need to build a, a parametric model using a uh, software based on uh, the physics of the understanding, uh, the understanding of the physics of the problem. And once you do that, you can put, uh, you can uh, make this whole process called loop. So starting from uh, design variables, uh, I don't know if you can read it, there are uh, five variables that are chosen here. Uh, and there is a range of uh, those variables and in the parametric modeling uh, package or framework, uh, the new design candidate is created. Here it's a hull. And for the safety analysis, you need to do a grid generation. It's a mesh. And you apply safety solver uh, uh, to get the flow solution. And on here, there's a solution. Nice pictures of the uh, pre-surface wake and dynamic pressure on the hull. And you need to do the post-processing. Here, uh, resistance uh, curve is shown. Uh, you have to run uh, the CFT software until it converges. Once it's done, it automatically generates uh, uh, the objective function, uh, the, 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 the number of interest, and it feeds back into the optimization engine. And optimizer knows uh, uh, or decides what what are the, what's the next design candidates should be generated based on predetermined uh, optimized optimization framework or, or optimization uh, setup. As you can expect, CFD, the accuracy of the CFD uh, will be important because optimizer is a mathematical tool uh, an optimizer must, uh, can find next uh, design candidate but if the, the data fit, fed into the op, uh, optimizer is not good, then optimization um, may not be, uh, optimizer may not uh, be able to produce the real optimize, optimized uh, the design or, or the, the optimizer may end up with a wrong conclusions even. So, uh, this is a very popular case, uh, and uh, the case in public domain, uh, there's a benchmark test uh, and model test. Uh, almost all the uh, model basin out there, I think, including Marin, um, did a uh, uh, benchmark test of KCS, I believe. Uh, there are, there's a ton of data uh, for this hull, and this is a container ship. And we've been, uh, uh, this is a couple of years old, uh, but across the speed range, the difference between CFD and experimental 
resistance value is only 0.88%, uh, which is very good. Uh, and we do, I, I'm showing only one case. We do uh, here in ABS, we do benchmark test. Every time we have a, a new hole uh, and every time we have a, a comparable experimental data. So the KCS example was a couple of years old. Uh, and I, I, I am proud to say that uh, we've been able to uh, achieve a uh, comparable, uh, the, the discrepancy or comparable accuracy across uh, pretty much all the reputable motivations out there uh, and across all the all kinds of ships out there all different uh, different types of ships uh, so container ship bulk carrier tanker LNG carrier regardless of ship type uh, regardless of a motivation we were able to get a similar uh, comparisons uh, so um, I'm gonna show you one case study we did uh, a couple of, again a couple of years old ago um, here um, the 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 problem was optimize the whole phone min for minimum delivery power over uh, operation profile and operation profile was um, six percent of a design draft and balance draft 40 percent and I think the draft was all uh, same between two, uh, uh, but it could be uh, many more design, uh, uh, many more operational cells in the operational profile. This is just a simple test case we did uh, uh, in the house. Uh, cargo tank volume of uh, 85,000 uh, cubic meter. Hull maximum depth uh, was given, uh, and there was a draft uh, uh, constraint uh, uh, in the stud to ensure uh, propeller immersion. And the speed uh, was same for both cases. Uh, I don't know if you uh, uh, if you thought about it in this way. Uh, there are two types of uh, the the. the the tanker here, the one with uh, not as prominent uh, uh, prominent as uh, container ships, but still has a little bit of a bulb, uh, small bulbous bow, even though it is a tanker. And there's a, a, a group of a tanker with a vertical stem. So uh, we wanted to uh, take a look at under this condition, which one is better. And on the right side, uh, tanker uh, uh, tanker is uh, parameterized, but not only to tanker, the uh, tank volume uh, tank inside the hull is also parameterized so that uh, such that we can actually calculate uh, uh, the, the cargo capacity associated with each uh, design candidate, uh, satisfying uh, predetermined uh, uh, clearance between hull and tank. There were there, as you can expect, there are lots of details. I'm just showing you uh, the summary. Uh, here, baseline is shown as a big triangle. And VS is a vertical stem, and VB is the bulbous bow. Uh, and, and of course, we did a uh, Thousands of uh, evaluations. We're just showing a uh, Pareto frontier, uh, and x-axis is a PD uh, at design condition, and PD at ballast uh, condition is on the y-axis, and uh, the number is percentage improvement uh, compared to a uh, baseline. Uh, so on the uh, as you move uh, to the left side and uh, to the bottom, it's a better design. And Pareto Frontier uh, is, is one of X uh, type of uh, uh, tra trend on the scatter diagram uh, due to the competing uh, uh, objective functions. Uh, so PD, if you, basically, if you want to uh, improve design condition too much, then uh, it, it actually, the balance condition can actually become worse. Uh, 
or uh, and vice versa. So optimal is somewhere in between. That's what you are. That's why you are seeing Pareto frontier. And uh, and uh, small takeaway message is uh, uh, vertical stem seems to be better. Uh, appears to be better under these conditions. So maybe that's why a lot of uh, tankers uh, uh, I'm bulbous valve uh, and, and vertical stem. Uh, they're, 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 uh, to me, it seems that uh, it all depends on conditions. So it's hard to uh, uh, say uh, definitively. So I'm not going to say vertical stem is always better for tanker. But under this condition, uh, vertical stem seems to be better. And the improvement uh, is around uh, bigger than 6% uh, for both cases. So not only a uh, balance uh, draft, uh, but, but also at design draft, you are able to uh, get a improvement in uh, deliver power more than, uh, and the, um, the amount of improvement was about or more than 6%. Uh, one last thing I want to say is, the baseline is always uh, uh, important. If you start from a uh, uh, really uh, bad hole, you can get, you may be able to get 10% improvement or 20% improvement. But in this case, uh, I want to assure that baseline was a good one. Uh, it actually was a built one. So I agree with, uh, what Marin's statement, uh, uh, so it's a holistic approach. Uh, and even uh, in the optimizations, uh, there's no easy way of uh, uh, telling uh, one is better than the other. So it's all different. Uh, but one good example uh, that we've been using and we were uh, quite successful is a uh, multi-step approach in the optimizations. So we studied design space um, through uh, what's called Sobol search. It's, uh, it's the name of a Russian math mathematician. But, well, it's a fancy word, but it's what it is, is it's not really random. It discretized uh, design space uh, equally, more or less equally. And you create, you create uh, designs uh, representing those uh, portions of design space and then you evaluate it. The goal is uh, it's it's impossible to visualize multi-dimensional design space but if you do this uh, uh, then uh, you can get a better idea of uh, the trend between uh, two sets of design variables or maybe three sets of design variables and then you can uh, uh, have an idea of uh, maybe optimal design should be should be present somewhere here rather than here. So that's why we always start from uh, Sobol search, uh, and then we apply uh, uh, mathematical uh, tools such as a genetic algorithm to do the optimization. Uh, um, we call it global optimizations. Uh, and then once after we reach uh, uh, optimal uh, value, uh, uh, meeting all the constraints uh, we use in the genetic algorithm, we do further local optimizations uh, using uh, additional algorithms. We, we have, I don't know how many of you uh, did uh, 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 optimization uh, 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 class, but there is a wonderful tool called uh, Dakota. And in Dakota, there's uh, all kinds of tools. Uh, we use uh, uh, many different uh, sub-algorithms in the Dakota. Uh, it's in open source. Uh, students may want to take a look at it. And in the process, uh, uh, we use, we, we can reduce the design space. We start non-linear, non, uh, non multi-dimensional uh, space. And then maybe after that, after, after a couple of rounds, we realize, oh, this design variable X uh, is not really that important to reduce the objective function Y. Then we may exclude that uh, in the next round of optimization. So 
you need to have a, a good understanding of the physics of the problem. You need to understand the uh, mathematical uh, uh, mathematics of uh, of the optimizer, but because otherwise you may not be able to apply uh, uh, the optimal uh, optimizer for that round of optimization problems. Here, um, the wave patterns associated with uh, the case uh, we've sh I've shown you. Um, I don't have a line, but I didn't put a line here, but uh, this is a composition of uh, two uh, pictures. Upper part of the, uh, uh, the picture is a new variant, new hull, out of a uh, bulbous valve case. Uh, the bottom is the baseline. And as you may easily agree, the uh, Kelvin wake pattern has become uh, a lot softer, suggesting that uh, wave waking resistance associated with uh, uh, this condition is uh, a lot less. Here, uh, same thing, baseline didn't change, but uh, uh, the vertical stem uh, optimized one was also able to reduce uh, Kelvin wake uh, Pattern that introduced that uh, translated into uh, more than six percent of uh, uh, improvement. Not just wave uh, wake, but it also improved uh, other components of the uh, uh, design. Of course, here uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the parametric model. <coughs> Even if you uh, have that tool the tool we have or Marin's uh, uh, tool or someone else's uh, tool, you need to have a good understanding of, uh, of how parametric model works. Uh, that way you, you can uh, make a model based on understanding of, uh, uh, of the physics of the problem. Here, I, I presented two cases uh, with two models, vertical stem, uh, bow and bulbous bow. That was a couple of years ago. And then we decided, why not? Why, why can't we combine uh, uh, two into one? So here's the result. Uh, so the start of the, uh, the picture, it was a vertical. And then, um, and then once I changed the parameters, in this case, I am increasing uh, the length of the uh, bulb. So at the start point, at the starting point, it was uh, the length was zero, and as the length increases, it becomes uh, more like more more like more or less um, container vessel. Uh, the efficiency of the design space investigation or the optimization is really depend on how your parametric model is built. So uh, parametric model involves multiple design vari uh, variable. A number of design variable determines the design, uh, the, the dimensions of design space. So if you can, it's better to reduce uh, design variables always. But, but if by doing that, if you can uh, uh, have a chance of missing the important physics, then you shouldn't. So always a uh, balance. In this case, by combining uh, two models into one, we really don't have to uh, worry about uh, uh, running two sets of uh, uh, optimization problems. Uh, and in this case, it's a lot better. Also, how to implement the constraint should be considered in, uh, should be considered in building parameter model, depending on uh, that. It can uh, change things quite a bit. Uh, also, not only how it could be applied to many other things. Uh, I'm sure uh, many of you are interested in uh, wind propulsion. So, bar technology uh, uh, also mentioned they did optimize optimizations. Uh, but I can imagine um, something similar or uh, or something uh, in, in a smaller scale or a bigger scale, and there's always uh, uh, optimization problems. Uh, 
that can be uh, uh, created in the parametric uh, uh, modeling framework. On the left side, uh, unfortunately, it's not wind uh, turbine or wind bl uh, turbine blade. It's uh, airline uh, cargo tank. Here you see green mark and red mark. So uh, red means, uh, and the black line is hull section lines, the molded hull lines. And there is a regulatory uh, constraint, uh, IDC code. Depending on uh, uh, cargo capacity, you need to have a uh, cargo volume. You need to have a certain minimum uh, distance between uh, uh, the tank and and the hull molded hull line. Once once we start changing hull form, if we don't have something like this. By this, I mean automatically che checking the whole tank clearance. But to, uh, it's gonna be a disaster, and it's not gonna be automatic. We have if someone has to more, more manually check, but that's not gonna work. So we built a parametric model, uh, or the the we programmed it in a, into a parametric model, uh, and. and 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 we automatically checks uh, the clearance. By the way, the tank uh, itself is also parameterized. So I don't have a dimension here, but these dimensions, depending on these dimensions, it creates a volume automatically, and and it creates uh, the the tank automatically, and it calculates a uh, cargo uh, the cargo volume automatically. On the left side, it's uh, it's uh, not fully parametric. It's a partially parametric model for asymmetric stern hull uh, to improve uh, 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 the flow pattern into uh, a propeller plane. And here, we didn't parameterize uh, entire hull. We didn't even parameterize uh, uh, the stern. We just picked uh, the stern belly line and we modified uh, uh, we uh, drag it on the left side, and then hull follows uh, uh, that line. So the the possibility is almost endless, uh, and and CFD is a lot cheaper. It's uh, uh, feasible. It becomes practical for hull pump uh, evaluations. So how form design and optimization is feasible. In ABS, we only it only takes about 30 minutes or so to do the evaluation of one hull. Uh, and HP, high performance computer computing systems uh, are getting cheaper. It's not free, but it's getting cheaper. So uh, you can evaluate hundreds, maybe thousands of hulls uh, in a day which was not possible before. And out of that, you can pick up uh, the most, the best hull, satisfying your constraint and, and based on your objective functions. But it still requires a holistic knowledge and experience, com computational fluid dynamics, uh, so you have to uh, have a good uh, CFD framework uh, of which re result you can rely on. You need to uh, know parametric modeling, model, parametric CAD modeling software, and and you need to be able to drive that, and you need to have a good understanding of uh, uh, of the of the op optimizers. Because a lot of times it's nonlinear, uh, multi-objective optimizations, and uh, fourth and fifth, it's a ship related. Um, here I'm talking about ship design, uh, but you have to have a good understanding of the physics of the problem. Basically, ship resistance, propulsion, and powering, and also uh, you need to know ship design and constructions and uh, operations, uh, which. A lot of times is translated into uh, uh, design constraints uh, in the optimizers. Uh, so this is all I have. Do you have any questions? 
Yes, Professor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, how uh, fine are these meshes that we're using in CFP? How many, how many cells approximately are you? For resistance problems, uh, I mean, there are all kinds of techniques, but uh, we used around 2 million uh, for fine grid. And for the optimization uh, problems, uh, uh, for each individual iterations of optimizers, we could uh, use uh, medium grid uh, so that we can speed things up. Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, what's, what matters during the optimization routine is correlations. Correlations uh, between different uh, design candidates. You want to know if this one is this design A is better than design B by how much, but you don't necessarily want to uh, uh, know uh, this number is accurate to the uh, uh, the number you'd get from the model basis. So as long as you have a good uh, uh, correlations with your uh, meshing, uh, meshing um, standard or, or all the framework, you could even uh, apply, I guess, a uh, million. Oh. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Yes, sir. You mentioned using the genetic algorithm. Have you explored other optimization methods? Yeah, we use uh, all kinds of optimizers, uh, um, but genetic algorithm uh, is more or less the most reliable one for the global optimization optimization uh, problems we have. But yeah, definitely we do uh, use uh, different variants. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone who's shown up. Uh, our next presenter is going to be Stephen Woods uh, to present his concept of the sail freighter design. For the web students that have just shown up, uh, good morning, welcome to the ship design, uh, or, I'm sorry, sustainability and ship design and operation conference. We will, uh, so for this hour of the Monday lecture, we have two presentations. Uh, so please sit tight and enjoy. Stephen, it is all yours. All right. All right. Uh, so I'm Stephen Woods. I'll be presenting on a uh, service pattern uh, sail freighter. Uh, I'm going to make sure everyone knows right off the bat that I am not a naval architect. I'm barely a sailor. Uh, I am a historian. I have worked for 20 years in museums. Uh, I dished out of that field. Uh, however, and uh, ended up working in the sustainability field. My master's is in sustainable and resilient communities. Uh, and I switched, made that switch because every time someone was saying like, oh, you know, how would we possibly solve this great sustainability crisis? I was physically holding the solution that had been used for several hundred years. Uh, so that's how I've come to uh, this field. And so this is based on uh, some things you might not normally hear from naval architecture. Some of this is based on the history of using uh, wind propulsion, and this is also based on uh, use for coastal trade. So this is going to be short sea shipping and uh, as opposed to transatlantic type stuff. Now, let's start with some definitions. First thing we're talking about, this is an open source design proposal. Uh, there are good reasons to use that. Open source started as a software tool, uh, I was just mentioned, uh, and it's essentially just publishing what you have so anyone can modify it and anyone can use it for free. There are other correlations to that, uh, open source hardware. This is used for hardware, but also uh, for things that would be copyrighted, there are the Creative Commons licenses. Uh, and then of course you can declare something in the public domain. That would be the objective of this, because if you're going to get a sail freight uh, operation going, well, it turns out it's really helpful if you have some ship plans and you can propose what ship you're going to use. Now, I've said sail freight a couple of times. This is what I actually mean. For any terribly classically educated people in the, in the house that will understand the uh, trivium reference there, uh, sail freight is not just the same as just wind propulsion or wind assisted propulsion. 
Uh, it is a type of wind shipping, but it is its own unique sector. It's normally in small vessels, normally using uh, traditional rigs. And on the technical side of things, it's all the way over at the, you know, maybe 10% using your motor, 10 to, 10 to 15%. Uh, it is designed not necessarily to optimize ship, but to, for the absolute lowest carbon emissions per ton kilometer. Uh, there's more information on all that sort of thing in the Stale Freight Handbook, which is a uh, Creative Commons, uh, it's an open source publication from the Center for Post-Carbon Logistics. Uh, now, there is very good reason to, to create a open source sail freighter design. Uh, first off, there are vessels out there we could use. You know, there, is, there are a couple. We could use regular fiberglass recreational boats if we really wanted to. That's being done right now by Aegean Sail Cargo in the Aegean at very small amounts of cargo. Uh, but it's cheap. But you'd need billions of these things to move a decent amount of stuff. Uh, a lot of other sail freight projects are restored historic vessels. Uh, the schooner Apollonia, the Gallant, Aventure, Tres Hombres, those are all old vessels that were refit for this use. There's only so many of them left. Even if we refit all of them, that's still not a lot of fleet tonnage. And then, of course, there's the new build sail freighters, things like Grand Sail, uh, TWOT, Seva. Uh, those are all being built but those are a very capital intensive project. Uh, you know, those are specific designs meant for specific trades. Uh, it's a high capital requirement. You have to have the money to invest in that plan uh, in order to get anything going. Uh, a lot of these designs also, and we'll go over a couple in a few moments, uh, are not designed to maximize your fleet tonnage. When you're looking at sustainable shipping and you're looking at sustainable transportation as a whole, shipping is a part of, there are 27 years to decarbonize literally everything to zero or you cook the planet. That is a very short time limit. Save has been under construction since 2018. Still hasn't launched yet. It's not nearly fast enough. So, if you're going to make these, they need to maximize the fleet tonnage you can build in a certain period of time. That means you need to set it around regulatory barriers. For these smaller vessels, that's license progressions. Your captain's licenses are at 25 tons, 50 tons, and 100 tons, gross register tons, because the US hasn't caught up to the uh, uh, measurement treaties of 1960s. So that needs to be set so not only do you have a 25 gross register ton design so that you're getting the most out of that captain's license, but it also has to be stepped for upgrades so that a captain or crew who start on one of these smaller vessels can then eventually upgrade their license to move to a larger vessel as you increase the fleet of larger vessels. Um, and then the other big thing that hasn't been covered yet is that a lot of the designs were originally leisure vessels that were converted to cargo. These are very different vessel types, so they need to be uh, dealt with differently. Now, there are existing designs, as I said, quite a few of them. Uh, a lot of them fail to live up to exactly what I would uh, hope for, but have a lot of things worth taking. This is one of the electric clippers by Derek Ellard. He's an Australian uh, boatwright and ship designer. This one is uh, about 100 feet long, designed to take containerization and designed for use in the South Pacific. Uh, it's a good design, but because of measurement issues and a number of other things, it doesn't really fit the U.S. Uh, or coastal trade requirements terribly well for our environment. Uh, these are uh, schooner designs by Tad Roberts. They are essentially the same schooner in three different sizes. He's got a 28 gross register ton one. That's a problem because your licenses are 25, 50, and 100. So you have to have a 50 ton license to sail that one, but you're only using something like 49% or 59 of the uh, actual license tonnage. And the next one down is 17. You need a 25 ton license to sail that. You're missing eight register tons that you could be putting to work. And it's below the 18 gross register ton threshold that would be needed for that captain and crew to upgrade their licenses to 50 ton. So a couple of drawbacks there, but that wouldn't be a huge project to uh, then redraw to fit those requirements. This is an, actually an open source design by uh, Jeff Utmark. Uh, he designed this in 2015 to work on the Erie Canal, Long Island Sound. Uh, it's a great design. I actually really like it, uh, but it's 80 feet. 
So it's under a whole different level of regulation and inspections and thus cost and licensing requirements because it's 80 feet, not 65. If it's 65 feet or below, it's under T-boat regulations, which simplifies your life quite a bit. Uh, another open source design is the uh, Greenheart vessel. This was designed again for the South Pacific, uh, small island states. I like it, it's pretty good, but it has a couple of drawbacks, I would say, uh, mostly in its rig. Uh, the rig uh, dedicates everything to one mast, which is, uh, well, from my military background as well, uh, we like things that don't have single points of failure. Uh, and it's also over complex. Uh, so that requires a whole new level of training for support for this design. This is another open source design. This one is uh, the series of the Vermont Sail Freight Project. Built in 2013, sailed to New York City from uh, Virgins, Vermont, uh, I believe three times in total in 2013 and 14, and uh, worked quite well. Can carry 10 tons of uh, cargo. Uh, I would not trust this on open or rugged waters. Uh, it's literally a slightly pointy on the ends plywood box uh, with a yawl rig on it. So ideal for amateurs, which is exactly what that project was, uh, but it was successful. But you can't bring this, you know, around Cape Cod if you want to actually get there in one piece or uh, avoid, um, what's the term, uh, unscheduled submarine capabilities testing. Uh, there are other sources of design as well. Uh, oil prices have gone up before. During the last oil crisis, there were dozens of designs that were created and published. A lot of what we're doing today in this wind assist propulsion research, honestly, is just rehashing what happened 50 years ago but with computers and better composites now. Uh, this design was set up for Tonga for inter-island trading. I'm not sure any of them were ever built. It is another good design. It was designed for crew efficiency, which is going to be critical in this because there's not a lot of training facilities for uh, wind propulsion. Uh, so that would be helpful. This could be retooled, but again, it does need to be retooled and there's not a lot of detail in the design. Uh, this was presented at the same conference in 1985 uh, in Manila. It was the original Indosail design. It's modular. This is a great thing to pirate if we're going to do anything open source. Uh, this is actually very similar to the Liberty ships in the Second World War, and that you just kind of stick in more or fewer uh, middle sections to get the tonnage that you want. Uh, that could be modified, of course. And uh, one of these in a three map configuration right there is being built right now for the Marshall Islands. So we'll see how that one performs. Now, again, we want to maximize fleet capacity. How do you do that? Free plans, plans that people can take. And yeah, it's not gonna be completely free. We're going to put a lot of labor into this. It's still gonna cost something to build the ship. But if you're trying to get investors for a project like this, and you have to start out spending 10 grand to get anything like plans to consider, that project now doesn't happen. So with freely available plans, now we have rapidly diffusible plans that can actually make a big difference. They need to be much like the Liberty ships, designed for simple and rapid construction. That's a design constraint here. Uh, because again, 27 years, that's it. Uh, as was mentioned with captain's licenses, every crew and every ship has to have the you know, maximum possible out of the crew uh, and the vessel itself. They should be able to start out really simple, like you know, not much better than camping aboard and then improve as you go depending on the capital level available to the project. And the nice thing about open source is no one person has to do all of this work. If you like making sale plans, great, just do that part. If you like uh, you know, hull, optimize, hull optimization, just do that part. There's no you know, dedicating thousands of hours for one person or a very small team that's then not going to get paid. It can be a couple hours per person if you really wanted to. Uh, I'm going to put the requirements up here on the screen. These are in the paper version as well. These are learned from specific experience with Schooner Apollonia, with other sail freighters that are active right now. Uh, it's also learning a lot from uh, the history of coastal sailing cargo. Uh, now, the tonnages are set up there uh, for a good reason. The rig variants are set there for a good reason as well. Schooners are highly crew efficient and they're simple and they're easy. Um, and this rig is well known. Uh, you can take someone who has experience on leisure sailboats, get them on one of these and they won't be completely lost. 
and you don't need high capital or high tech stuff to trim those sails or anything. Uh, rope is a pretty old technology. Uh, it only dates back about 20,000 years. Uh, so, you know, pretty sure we'll uh, have people familiar with it. Uh, the other good thing about them, this is vessels under 1,000 tons. Uh, this was out of my master's thesis. Uh, tons per sailor compared to the ship's tonnage. Schooners are the orange line. So that's going to definitely be a rig we will want to be looking at because of the optimization of less available crew than we would like. The other vessel that we could really use would be something to use in canals. Uh, there are a group of us currently looking right now to expand Apollonia's operations into <laughs> the New York State Canal System, Lake Champlain, a number of other places as well. It would be really great to have something that worked decently in a canal. Uh, the problem with canals is low bridges, and if you leave masts up when you try to go under a low bridge, it causes paperwork. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, now, same other basic requirements, uh, but this would really need electrification. And uh, I'm pirating the counterweighted mast uh, directly off of the Norfolk wherries that were used in England through from really the very early 18th century into the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it's a really neat design, actually. Uh, here's the sail plan on one of them. Uh, but I'm going to move over here. The rig was actually designed with a counterweight. Otherwise, it's a cat rig. So if you're about to hit a bridge, you just undo the forestay, uh, drop the sail, and lean on the mast. And it folds down. And when you get clear of the bridge, you let go and then redo the forest day and put sail back. Uh, so you can do wind propulsion in canals. It just takes a little bit more thought and uh, care. Uh, if you have a lot of bridges and you're not going to have much wind at all, just strip the rig off of it, cover it in solar panels, and you now have a self-sufficient electric canal barge. The other thing we're going to need, which has been stripped out from small vessels over the last hundred years, is infrastructure. Uh, luckily, that can just be a bunch of barges. Schooner Apollonia uses a large number of uh, different types of docking arrangements. A lot of them are commercial marinas. Those, by the way, can be kind of a pain in the neck because those docks are not designed to you know, stack cargo on. Uh, but a couple of the places they dock are just barges. So there's been a, a couple of sketches made up for essentially just a big old barge with some containers on it for warehousing. Warehousing will be important to this because you can't precisely schedule arriving with sale. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, so you need warehousing to cushion your, your earlier late arrival and other people's pickup. You just drop this wherever there's a convenient spot. You only need one ramp to land. And if you need more dock space and more depot space, tie a couple of these together. Uh, so that is a design project that should also be undertaken at some point, preferably for uh, the ability to build relatively locally. And that is essentially what I have. Those are the requirements that we're looking at, that we've learned from experience and from history we will need uh, for coastal trade. And the thing I would like to point out for coastal trade, which uh, was pointed out by uh, Marin as well, is that uh, a container ship, you know, that's what, 12 grams of CO2 per ton kilometer cargo-ish. The average for trucking in the U.S. is about 107. So if we're really going to decarbonize things, we're not selling marine transport. What we're selling is getting something from point A to point B. So if we want to reduce the carbon, what we really need to be doing is shifting things from rail and from trucks onto the water. And then we'll have a much better time decarbonizing from there. All right, questions? Uh, there's just one question online. All right, go for it. Uh, you're allowed to talk. Ping, if you'd like, you can unmute yourself. I guess all uh, questions in house? Uh, yes. In, in this banking, uh, are, still, are you still thinking you have to still have some type of mechanical propulsion rather than wind at all? Yes. Um, sail only has gotten very difficult uh, over the last 100 years. 
principally due to dock design. Nobody puts a dock where you can sail on and off anymore, because why would you? You have a motor. Uh, and most sail freighters now are using, you know, have engines available, uh, and they're using them for a number of different you know, engine use strategies. The main one that's in use right now is just docking in emergencies. But it is really helpful when you're about to go on a lee shore to just go, well, that's going to be bad. Turn the key and motor off. <laughs> um, that's much better than the 17th century option of um, really, really hoping you can swim uh, as, far, as far as those rocks are out from shore. Yes. The open source kind of design is not really fast. Give an example of an open source engineering design that has worked before, maybe not necessarily in that art field, but in other fields. Um, yeah, uh, series. Uh, I actually have the designs with me. If anybody wants to talk about them later, uh, I have the design for series with me. It was uh, open source recently, and we know that made several trips. Uh, so that's a open source design that's been used uh, in uh, naval architecture field. Uh, for other open source stuff, uh, who has a Linux phone here? Or a uh, Android phone, rather. Yeah, that's off of Linux. That's that's open source right there. Uh, open source hardware. Uh, there's been a number of uh, successes, uh, most of which are you know dropping off the face of uh, dropping off my memory at the moment. Uh, there's a whole uh, system though at the moment. My brother's a farmer, so of course I would end up knowing this. Uh, there's a system farm hack. It's a website farmhack.org. Uh, and it's a whole bunch of open source designs for farm tools. And uh, those have been used extensively. I know at least six or eight farmers who are using them right now. Uh, a lot of it is relatively simple stuff. Uh, but I will tell you when you are trying to uh, assist your brother with hacking through a quarter acre of pumpkins that took over a compost pile, it's real convenient to have those. Uh, another good one is uh, the Cargo Carla cargo bike uh, and trailer system. That all has also been open sourced and those are in use the world over. Uh, and they're quite common, they work quite well. Yes. And what was the reason for sticking with the older like classic rigs that you want to Um the idea on that is partly it's well understood, partly it's low capital. Um, you know, if you want to put on Wind wings, that's that's a lot of capital. That needs a lot of different skill. Uh, it needs a lot more software intensive. That might be strategic materials <laughs> intensive. Um, you could do a Marconi rig, that would be fine. Uh, that might give you a little bit better upwind performance. Uh, but the gaff rig in, uh, and any any type of schooner rig or traditional rig has those advantages of well understood, low capital. Uh, and part of that again comes down to training. Um, when, when you look at, uh, when I wrote my master's thesis, it was on flying New York City by sail as an adaptation of climate change. Uh, and the very short version is we're going to need a lot of bigger boats. Um, but we're talking 65,000 sailors in less than 20 years, uh, just for the fleet to supply New York. That's not counting any other city in the U.S., assuming they get about 50% of their food by sail. Which is reasonable in the New York metro area. Food shame. That's a heck of a lot of people. Tall ships, you, tall ships America can't train that many people in the amount of time they have. But if you put all the US sailing and ASA schools and leisure sailors together, then yes, you can train that many people to be that familiar with that type of thing. Anything else? Oh, over there. Oh. What kind of like cargo types would you consider the most useful? Would it be like small, smaller and sailing cargo vessels? Would it be like uh, smaller, like luxury great bulk, um, things that like can market uh, sustainability and navigation and like fleets and all that? Uh, yes, you're you're on the right track. Uh, the main things uh, are uh, palletized cargo. Containers are out the window. They're heavy. They're awkward. They're large. Um, if you try to fit one container on a, on a 25 grocery extra ton vessel, you pretty much run out of vessel. Uh, so it's going to be palletized and grateful. Right now, much of what is moving is things like wine, uh, chocolate, rum, uh, other high value goods. Schooner Apollonia is an exception to that. Uh, they move mostly malt, 
Uh, they will learn about a hot sauce, frankly enough. Um, but uh, yeah, malt, beer, uh, they move a decent amount of, uh, in October, just haul a whole bunch of lumber strapped to the deck like it was sometime in 1860 something. Uh, that was an interesting experience tying that down. Um, so big bulk cargoes historically were the last thing that sail stopped moving. Uh, so that's uh, all going to be candidates. For this smaller scale vessel though, initially it's gonna be higher, higher value cargoes. It's gonna be part of people's marketing. Uh, but eventually uh, anything that's not hazardous would be my reply. Uh, probably no just straight blocks of metallic sodium. That seems like a bad idea. All right. Anything else? We have a couple on lines. Okay. Um, Dominique, if you'd like, you can unmute yourself. Dominique, did you have a question? Maybe we need to go through chat. I'm, 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 I'm suggested. <laughs> right, we, have, we have a couple of questions through chat as well. Uh, okay. What did the economics look like for a 25 ton cross Long Island sound vessel? Uh, actually, reasonably good. Uh, there was one built in, uh, I believe it was 1971, that was in service for about five years. Uh, then the uh, price of oil jumped and they were in service a little bit more intensively for a couple of years. When the price of oil dropped, of course, they uh, switched to an educational mission and then they ran out of gas. Uh, the advantage we have here is that oil prices are probably not going to go down. Uh, and of course, there's another incentive. So for a short distance trade, that would be ideal, especially like across the sound, um, uh, that would work pretty decently. Uh, even in small vessels, uh, for example, in Ireland, where fuel was expensive, which is a good proxy for what we're about to run into, uh, and constraints with fossil fuels, the uh, Galway hookers, uh, which carried about 10 tons each, about 40 feet, uh, continued operations into the 1960s. So even something that small was viable that late in a developed country. Yes. Um... In regards to Long Island Sound, just if you like, even just sit and watch out from here, most of the stuff that's moved is, ironically enough, oil, which mm -hmm. obviously, eventually, one would like that to just not be the case. But yes, in the more immediate term, would a design like this have any capabilities in that regard? Uh, for oil? Yeah. Yeah, you can build these as a tanker. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily be economic for very much for that. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, it's a relatively small amount, um, but you could if you wanted to. The thing to look at would probably be what you're going to be moving when fossil fuels are retired. Uh, yeah, you can electrify things, but we're still going to have a lot of equipment that runs on things like biodiesel, uh, biogas, things of that nature. Those will still need, need to be moved, and they'll be moved in smaller quantities because there will simply be less. Of them. So a couple of these as small tankers would probably make a decent amount of sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.